resistant against all types of fundamentalism. The blasphemer's banquet table. There, on mirrored cushions, will sit Voltaire, me, Molière, Omar Khayyam, Lord Byron, and that, that Salman Rushdie's chair. It's perfect for tonight's blasphemer's meeting, this place renowned in Bradford for good eating that used to be a church and gets its name from the poet who loves this life, however fleeting, Omar Khayyam, who also loved his wine and had no care for those cascade crammed castles in the air the Koran promises to those who sacrifice this fleeting life for afterlife up there. Often called the Voltaire of the East, Omar Khayyam will pour wine at our feast, and I'll propose the toast to Salman Rushdie, and all those then or now damned by some priest. And frankly, uh, uh, I wish I'd written a more critical book. When I see bigots wanting Rushdie dead, burning a book I'm sure they've never read, marble bust or not, Voltaire's got stored a much more critical book in this old head. I too heard bigots rant, rave, and revile books of mine which, after a short while, were canonized as classics, which is why you always see Voltaire with this wry smile. A boy in Abfeel, for having sung a mildly blasphemous ballad, had his tongue ripped from its roots and on his blazing body, my philosophical dictionary was flung. And I, whose books got flung into the blaze of inquisitorial autodafes, am now a monument with Moliere in the crush bar of the Comédie Française. Koran denounces unbelievers who, 
quote, love this fleeting life, unquote, I do. I'm an unbeliever. I love this life. I don't believe their paradise is true. The afterlife for which that chill corpse prayed was a paradise of fountains and green shade and dark-eyed houris and a garden where roses bloom forever and don't fade. Unlike this world of ours where things fade fast, in a place where nothing changes and things last, the fatwa fascist lolls in paradise and waters full of stars go flowing past. And as a righteous man, he'll be arrayed in richest silk and delicate brocade and be served sherbets by chaste virgins he whose fatwa made the world afraid and while the ayatollah at a fountain side chooses some dark-eyed virgin for a bride down here where life is fleeting and time flies a man I've asked to dinner has to hide. This isn't paradise, but the Bradford Square where Rushdie's book got burned, just over there. By reading it, where fools had it cremated, I bring it whole again, out of the air. Near where the National Theatre does a play by one priest smeared as Satan in his day, I read a book by one dubbed Satan now, whose work, like Moliere's, is here to stay. And of the afterlife, I have no heed. What more could a godless mortal need than a samosa and a can of beer and books like Rushdie's to sit here and read. And I've asked its hidden author out to eat with five blasphemers he might like to meet at the Omar Khayyam Tandoori, not far from here, near Bradford's Paradise Street. At this blasphemer's banquet I've set up, Omar Khayyam will cry, come fill the cup, and Moliere, Voltaire, Lord Byron and myself will toast the satanic verses when we sup. Omar Khayyam, the poet of Iran, whose quatrain I'm using here as best I can, will pour for us his choicest flask of wine while I pass round the Peshawari Nan. Blasphemers sharing Bradford bread and wine are due to rendezvous at half past nine after blasphemer Moliere at the Alhambra, in a blasphemer's English version, mine. Your dark philosophy's too bleak by half. Your moods of black despair just make me laugh. I think by now I know you pretty well. We're very like Ariste and Scannerelle, the brothers in that thing by Molière. You know, the school for husbands, that one where... For God's sake, spare us Molière quotations. <laughs> but still, I'm at a loss to know what's in my poetry. Jesus wept, it's bloody rubbish. <laughs> Priests may turn to piety and prayer. I turn to poetry and plays by Moliere. Theatre, said Hugo, is a place for forming souls, but the only gods it knows are those up there. Believing only in this life below, 
These are the only gods I'll ever know. We live and die, and only time destroys us, falling forever into the big O. That great big O of nothingness that swallows poets and priests, queens and ayatollahs, not only infidels, but fundamentalists, whether in black turbans or dog collars. In Moliere's own time, these pious frauds thought it a blasphemy to tread the boards. He'd be gratified to see his blasphemies doing slightly better business and the Lord's. Because he died and no priest heard him swear that he abjured the stage, this Moliere was buried without candles at the dead of night, a fate the church made many actors share. Bradford, when Charles Rice was alive, saw the church and theatres both thrive. Now the churches have new uses, and of the theatres, only the Alhambra managed to survive. And of the many churches Charles Rice knew, of those left standing, there are very few with singing Sabbath congregations. Mosques are the only sacred houses now built new. One church where some of these at rest come from is long since flattened by Luftwaffe bombs. The four-square gospel church is auction rooms. The Presbyterian purveys crisp poppadoms. The Golden Dome and Muezzin's minaret has panoramas on his panto set for Ali Baba or Aladdin at the Royal were all the Orient that Charles Rice met. The only influence then out of Iran, before the fanatic Ayatollah, was a man who praised wine and despised the paradise promised to Muslim men by the Koran. But this Bradford tomb with Rubaiyat quatrain faces the half-built mosque in East Squire Lane, its gold dome shining, and so new it's still not felt a drop of Bradford rain. Still domeless girders open to the sky, an even bigger mosque goes up. Nearby our church, Tanduri Rendezvous, named after the poet who penned this gravestone's gold rubai. Lo, some we loved, the loveliest and the best that time and fate of all their vintage pressed have drunk their cup a round or two before and one by one crept silently to rest.
which the life of Christ ought to exert upon us all. He went about doing good that he might influence us to do the same. St. Andrews, built in 1849, nourishes Bradford under a new sign, and beer and Bombay special biryani, oust Bible bombast from the Scots divine. And imbibers have a few months grace before these girders get their gold dome on next door, and Muezzin's call sours Omar's ruby vintage, curdling the stomach of the currivore. Where there was passionate preaching and packed pews, a king prawn rogan josh and vindaloos. For Bradford devotees of Indian food, the Omar Khayyam restaurant is good news. The blasphemer's banquet table. There, on mirrored cushions, will sit Voltaire, me, Moliere, Omar Khayyam, Lord Byron, and that, that Salman Rushdie's chair. A wine bibber. Oh, the beacon imbibes that spirit. Oh, surely. Blessing of time that bears us all away, and how God alone is resistant to decay, but his congregations and his churches aren't. Where's the pulpit? Where's the cross? And where are they? Where some of Bradford's past already lies, life flowers in these bright, affirming eyes. Though her forehead rests on some old grave, she thinks that time stays still and never flies. It won't be very long before she knows that everything will vanish with the rose. And then she'll either love life more because it's fleeting or hate the flower and life, because it goes. Beautiful sisters in their white and green, innocent of what these crude words mean, but maybe they will soon discover beauty is inescapably bound up with the obscene. Various creeds attempt to, but can't split the world of the spirit from the world of shit. Crude scrawls and sacred scrolls come from one mind. Scarface subverts the saint and won't submit. This message, leave no litter in her do, seems to have some problem getting through. Man's fear of his own filth makes him go seeking the unblemished beautiful in the untrue. The thorny whys and wherefores, awkward whences, things that seduce or shame or shock the senses, panic the one book creeds into erecting a fence against all filth and all offenses. Feeling that life seems blasted by some blight we keep on yearning for some purer light. But this, as Bertrand Russell wrote, is born from our deep fear of everlasting night. Fear of that big O that swallows whole both the human body and the soul. Fear of time that makes us live and die. Fear of transience that takes its daily toll. Fear of living fear of being dead, fear that what we love most soon is fled, 
fear of loving what is fleeting for itself, our fear of what false prophets make us dread, of doomsday with its dreadful but false dooms, of time that bustles men back into tombs, of that fleeting transience that can transform the four-square gospel church to auction rooms. The transience that makes the life warmed ring dangle for buyers from a numbered string and numbers us, knick-knacks of nothingness, the going, going, gone of everything. Sam, you had a pound for the lot. Have a pound, two. Have we two now? It's a one. Have we done it? Well, couldn't you take something at 50 quid? <laughs> Who was it? Mrs. Bennett. Right, thank you. 154 is the gold ring. 154. Where should be a tenner? A fiver then. A gold ring is this. Must be at scrap value of this sort of money. So I've had a fiver. Three pounds then. Have we three? Right, we haven't. Put it down, Brian. Silver frame, 155. 155 for the silver frame. 40 pounds for it. 20 then. Bishops 20 only once burned now. books and people. Here, it's Mr. Bishop, Bradford auctioneer who has them boxed and bundled in job lots with wedding rings and repro jardinier. Gold wedding ring, lot 140, gold wedding band. 15 for this, a tenner then. Have a tenner bid, 12 for the others. Now it's 35. You can't, uh, you can't be tuning into the mass media. Font of all knowledge is that. Have we all done then at 35 pounds? Is that it? And it's Mr. Capstick at 35 pounds. Lot two, six, seven, or three bundles of books. Many tomes of ancient knowledge there. Here we go. Where should we be? 20 pounds. The 10 out of 5 out of 5 are only bidding 7. Have 7, 9, 10, sir. 10 are you trying? 12. 14 now. Have 14. 16, 18. 18 where? It's 16. Are we done at 16? All right. We're selling lot 253 now, which is... What's it made of? Marble. It's marble, isn't it, Brian? This marble bust. Right. Lot 253. Right. Where do we start on this? An unusual item. Shall we say 20 pounds? A 10 and have 10, 12. Quickly at 12. Have 12. Quickly at 12 for the lot now. Have 12. 14. 16. 16. 18. 20 now. Have 20 bid. 22. Are you sure it's not 22? Have 20 bid. Have we all done that at 20 pounds? Mr. Nicholson at 20 pounds. Harrison at 20 pounds. <laughs> well, there's one thing that can be said. Your firm's not travelled before you. Is that correct, sir? Thank you, right. Time that gives and takes our fame and fate and puts, say, Shakespeare's features on a plate or a Persian poet's name on a tandoori can cast aside all we commemorate and make lot 86 or lot 14 even out of cardinal and queen and bring the holy and the high and mighty to the falling gavel or the guillotine. When a small boy bellows, more, more, more for Salman Rushdie, and fanatics roar, death to the imagination, a revival's due of work I wrote two centuries before. When I have to watch this Paris square, packed with murderous protest, then with prayer at the feet of the Republic, then it's time that France, and even Britain, read Voltaire.
Byron heaves a bronze, Byronic sigh to see familiar bigotry march by. But being dead since 1824 and cast in bronze, he casts a colder eye. Robert Southey, poet laureate and fool, said Byron headed the satanic school of poetry, which, he thundered, undermined all religious faith and moral rule. And a satanic poet, so Southey said, goes on accumulating guilt when he is dead, as long as copies of his verses circulate and go on, unlike Southey's, being read. My satanic poem satanic play made bigots brand me satan in my day have patience brother satan you might be a bronze like me in bradford or bombay and down the river just a little way the national theater's done a matinee of a 300-year-old piece by Moliere, branded by bigots, the Satan of his day. And those condemned in God's or Allah's name may end up statues in the Hall of Fame. The most irreligious man who ever lived, some priest called Moliere, I got the same. Molière's Tartuffe, the first French play to strip hypocrisy's sour mask away, was the one most hated by fundamentalists, till my play about the prophet. Though not much played since 1742, a revival of my plays long overdue. By Mahomet, I meant all fundamentalists, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, and Jew. <laughs> We have to preserve and maintain in this island true Protestantism and the Protestant way of life. And I am Jews for the Roman Catholic Church today. We Protestants are here in Ireland to stay. In Baal Nahor if you know someone who wants to, who wants to kill you, Hashkain, get up first, Lord, go and kill him first. That is Judaism. That is Judaism. That is sanity. It is without question the most blasphemous, the most disrespectful, the most satanic movie that's ever been.
That's me. And one, two, three, four, five. Four of whom can't come. They're not alive. And one who can't because the Fatwa Führer has forced him into hiding to survive. Right from the beginning, I'm afraid, I knew you'd never make our Bradford rendezvous. But my invitation was a way of showing things you might still like to, but can't do. Say, stroll round Bradford like I did today. Watch the Comédie Française perform a play. A child pilot a chopper on a roundabout. Applaud the Voltaire's follies. Mahomet. The Ayatollah forced you to decline my invitation to share food and wine with poets branded as blasphemers, including Omar, now our restaurant sign. Omar Khayyam, the poet of Iran, the Voltaire of Persia, and a man who praised wine and despised the paradise promised to Muslim men by the Quran. The dead don't dine. Those under threat are not at liberty to come here yet. But when you're free, you're welcome. And meanwhile, I toast your talent on your TV set. Where you're in hiding, tuned to the BBC. I hope you get some joy in watching me raise my glass to the satanic verses to its brilliance, and yes, its blasphemy. Its blasphemy enabled man to break free from the Bible and Quran with their life-denying fundamentalists and hellfire such fanatics love to fan. Omar loves this fleeting life and knows that everything will vanish with the rose, and yet, instead of paradise, prefers this life of passion, pain, and passing shows. Omar writes how nothing stays the same, and it's an irony of fleeting fame that this tandoori, Omar Khayyam today, tomorrow will be called another name.